Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to the Brooklyn Book Festival. Um, if this is the, your first panel, please check out the rest of the festival's programming because there is an incredible lineup. But lucky for you, this one has the best lineup. Um, I am joined by four of my absolute favorite authors, and I'm very excited to introduce them. Um, just so everybody knows, there will be time at the end of this panel for you to ask questions of your own, so keep those in mind. But without further ado, I'm going to ask these esteemed authors to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about your current books. And Leah, why don't we start with you because you're the debut. Oh, oh my gosh, wow, I'm so honored. Okay, so um, I'm Leah Johnson. I'm the author of the novel, You Should See Me in a Crown. Um, do you need any other details or is that enough? <laughs> Come on, give us some details. Okay, perfect. Um, so <laughs> this is my book. It's about a girl named Liz Lighty who's growing up in a small and small-minded Midwestern hometown. And her only dream is to get out, but those plans are derailed when her financial aid falls through and she has to run for prom queen for the scholarship that's attached to it. Um, that would be tough enough for a wallflower like Liz, but it's made even more difficult when she begins to fall for her competition. Ting! <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'll go next. Um, <clears throat> my name is Aisha Saeed, and I write books for, um, I write picture books, middle grade, young adult, kind of the whole gamut. Um, and I wrote this year, which uh, it feels like a thousand years ago at this point, but it was February. <laughs> uh, a young adult book with Becky uh, Albert Hall, who's here, um, called Yes, No, Maybe So. And it's a love story um, about two teens who fall in love while they're canvassing for a local special election. Um, I'm Becky Albertalli. I am, um, along with Aisha, the co-author of Yes, No, Maybe So. Um, and um, since Aisha already explained the book, I'm going to just use this moment to say that like, I am a massive fan of all four authors who are <laughs> <with>, so <laughs> this is, like, this is um, a very exciting panel for me. <laughs> Don't get me started, Becky, because I'm just waiting for my window of opportunity to start fanning out over all of these. Uh -uh, so. uh -uh. <laughs> Just wait, just wait. <laughs> um, I'm Case and Calendar. I use they, them pronouns and sometimes he, him pronouns. And I wrote uh, Felix Ever After, which is about 17 year old Felix um, love who has never been in love and is afraid that he is one marginalization too many. But of course, I spend the book proving him wrong. Yay. <laughs> well, thank you guys for all of that. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to start with a short like icebreaker question. And this is going to be, I want you to tell me about your favorite fictional relationship or a fictional relationship that meant something to you. So if you shipped Mulder and Scully, if you were team PETA, if, uh, if, if Meredith Grey and Christina Yang are friendship goals to you, I want to hear about it. So tell me about your favorite fictional relationship. To Tara all the way. Oh. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Listen, I, I'm looking at Leah's face. I know that there have been so. <laughs> I understand. There's a lot of discourse around Zuko being a part of the colonizer. I understand all of that. But I also feel like there's so, so much important conversation around healing and growth and um, accountability. And I feel like he is the only example I can find in kind of like this redemption arc where it was so carefully and intentionally done that it has to be Zutara. That's how it was supposed to be. Kill, I will die. <laughs> I mean, I do agree that that is like the end game couple for the show. I don't know how they got to Aang Katara. Um, my response was mostly just like, how could you say something so controversial yet so brave? Uh <laughs> <laughs> I've said it before on, on social media, so I feel like whatever at this point. <laughs> um, I'll go next. Okay, so... Um, Normally I would say like Simon and Bram, but Becky's here. So it's like awkward for me to do that. And so I'm going to say- <laughs> Tell me about um, it. <laughs> I'm going to say Pacey and Joey from Dawson's Creek. Um, <laughs> like I'm taking it way back. So Classic. the thing is, you know, there's not often in like TV shows and movies anywhere where like the man is the one to like step back and allow the woman to shine and like pursue her goals. And like Pacey was that guy. Like he bought her a wall so that she could practice her <laughs> art like what are, are you serious like to me child me that was like peak romance <laughs> um this is like 
maybe too on brand for yes, no, maybe so. Um, and I also feel like I should maybe thinking the same. I think so. <laughs> you can speak for both of us then. <laughs> well, I'm sure like, this is a very important ship with much to say about it. But um, yeah, Aisha and I are both very into uh, Jim and Pam from the office. It was like kind of a defining couple dynamic, <laughs> um, I think for me, so. Yeah, that's Aww. exactly what I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> Jim and Pam. I'm actually it's leaving uh the office is leaving Netflix at the end of the year and so I am doing my final rewatch of it um before it leaves I even got a book the oral history of the office and reading all about how they set Jim and Pam up because even though like I don't write screenplays or tv it's just really interesting as a writer to see how they make you care and how they make you root for somebody um so yeah I pretty much have a PhD in Jim and Pam relationship at this point with all this stuff I I've deep dived in. So yeah, Becky, I'm with you on that. <laughs> yeah. Actually, Aisha, that dovetails into one of the questions that I had. I was going to ask um, all of you if you think that there is a secret to creating chemistry between two characters. Is there, do you personally have a formula? Do you, is there something that, that two characters need to have in order to work for, for readers to get invested in that relationship? Gosh, I, I don't know. You know, I think, I think um, for me, with yes, no, maybe so it was different because Becky was writing um, Jamie's character and I was writing Maya's character. And so that was really cool because it was so organic. And I think the fact that we're good friends in, in real life and it just, and the idea just kind of, it was such a joyful idea that came to us that it just, it just kind of happened. Um, it, it wasn't something that I think about. Um, I don't write a whole lot of romance. Um, like I think I've written a lot of middle grade picture books at this point, but um, when I'm writing romance, I definitely do study and read romance and romantic comedies, romantic books, young adult like romances and, and try to reread and learn from the people who do it so well, the people who make me want to shift these two characters, why? So I do, I do a lot of reading as my way of learning how to do that. So a couple of months ago, a friend of mine, um, Christina Forrest, who also writes romance, and I think she does so brilliantly, recommended this book called Romancing the Beat. And early on mm -hmm. in this book, it recommends, um, like one of the first ideas to like when you're crafting a romance, it's gonna work. It's like your main character and your love interest, their end goals should be at odds with one another. Like that creates an inherent tension to the narrative and like really drives the, it gives the book some like uh, forward momentum, right? And so that's one of the things that I think about often is like, okay, so what is it that has to keep these two characters apart that they have to be able to overcome in order to be together in the end? And so that to me creates like what is a super satisfying narrative. Um, but other than that, like in You Should See Me in a Crown, my love interest is just wish fulfillment. I was like, what do I want to give queer black girls in a love interest. Why well, I want them to see somebody who supports them wholeheartedly. I want them to see somebody who loves them and doesn't have to earn that love through trauma. I wanted somebody to just be really, really cool. Like, you know, like we, I feel like we've seen a lot of straight romances where you get to love the bad boy or like the one who skateboards in and out of scenes. And I was like, we're gonna give that to some queer girls and that's gonna be how we make this work. <laughs> so that was the heart of my, my romance, I think. Yeah, I also really love a good trope, just like enemies to lovers will probably always be one of my top favorites. So a good friends to lovers is great too. Um, and I think kind of like going along with what Leah just said, Leah, I feel like you actually mentioned that um, book on another panel and I bought it because of you and I love it so much. So. <laughs> oh, great. I keep, I'm like yeah. preaching the gospel of romancing the beat. <laughs> I think it's, it's so great. Um, and kind of, I, I mean, kind of along the same lines, I feel like also uh, kind of like learning, like a feel, characters tend to need to learn a lesson. And I feel like that character, like the romantic uh, love interest or end goal tends to be like what the lesson, like a symbol of what that person's lesson was. Um, and I don't know how to go into detail without basically spoiling all of Felix Ever After, but um, <laughs> Yeah, there were like basically two characters where one was the incorrect, unhealthy choice for Felix and one was the healthy choice and like the lesson that Felix needed to learn. Um, and that's why he ended up with the person he did. 
Um, Y'all, I have no idea if you can see me. I can hear you. I don't know if you can hear me. I got a call that I'm sure was um, somebody uh, political, <laughs> you know, maybe a Democrat, maybe not. Um, and it bumped me out of my um, Zoom window, um, which has not- I can, I can see you. I can both can see, see you and hear you. you. I figured you could see me, which is I've not been like picking my nose and stuff, but <laughs> um, as far as I'm aware. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's I I um I was so determined to get this solved um, while everybody else was um, giving beautiful answers. But I um yeah I may um maybe I should go ahead and give my answer and then um, log out and log back in. Would that be That's right? totally fine. I'm so sorry. Um, no, no. But um, yeah, I, I mean, my, I do not have a formula. Every single time I try to write a book, I, um, <laughs> I feel like I'm having to learn how to do it all over again. And um, I think for me, it just takes a lot of like sitting with these characters and getting to know them before I can make um, the romance work and it never feels like it's going to work until it does if that makes any mm -hmm. sense absolutely yeah no i i think i think that that, that makes sense <laughs> <laughs> um and i was gonna case on this uh, actually something that you spoke about touches on another question that i was going to ask which is um when you're writing books for young readers about relationships do you feel any like particular responsibility with regard to how you show them like do you feel like uh, do you think it is the responsibility of the author to show to model healthy relationships or maybe to model real unhealthy relationships um and you know what what goes into that choice And that question's for everybody, even though I just. Uh, well, I feel bad, Becky. Are you going? Are you trying to log out now? Or are you gonna? Oh, I found y'all. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was, but I couldn't find the log out, and then I just found my way back in. Okay. Cool. Um, Yay! I'm, I'm listening too. I don't need to be cut out, so I could I could hear everything. Yeah. Um. So the question was, do I feel a responsibility? I do feel a responsibility to an extent. Um knowing that there is such uh it is like a big responsibility to speak directly to teenagers and to know you can have a massive effect on their thoughts and um their own journeys and i think that for me i do want to be able to model unhealthy relationships but with like purpose and intention and kind of like explain like this is why this is unhealthy and maybe like red flags to look out for or even things that you yourself can learn from um for your own like makes mistakes that you might be making and like accountability that you can take. Uh, I think that I also try to not be like super condescending about because I think that adults tend to make the same mistakes and have like the same cycles. And these are things that I myself can be struggling with. So um, I think it's more like we're all in this together and I just want to be able to model uh, relationships as I, as I have experienced them as well. Yeah, I feel like I've said this a lot. And so anybody who's watched me on more than one event is gonna be like, Leah, God, get a different sound bite. But you know, <laughs> part of um, uh, what I feel about writing queer narratives, especially queer love stories, is that it shows more than story for story's sake, right? Like it shows story as blueprint for what is possible, um, especially for how young people can experience love. And so for me, I really, really want to show love that is not even always free from hurt because you have to have conflicts. Somebody has to have a climax somewhere in there. I don't know where it happens. I'm not good at plot, but I do know that everything has to come to a head at some point. Right. And so like, I don't necessarily want to show that like, oh, we never break up or we never have moments where we doubt ourselves or the person we're with, but I definitely want to give sort of a, a window into a possible world. And so I think the responsibility there is to be as honest as possible. And what is honest is that some days we wake up and things suck. Sometimes like, I don't, you know, I'm not going to choose what day is my trauma day and what day is the racism day and what day is the day I'm going to be a queer person. Like I am all those things all the time. And so part of telling a story about falling in love as all those identities, it's like, what does it mean to be all those things at once? Well, sometimes it's hard. And so, um, I want queer kids to have happy endings, but I also am like, 
look, sometimes we have a couple bumps in the road on the way there. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I think that's such a good and interesting question because, um, you know, I guess there's um, such a difference, I think, between, um, you know, a toxic relationship, um, you know, which, um, you know, that does exist. Um, and then, um, you know, you have kind of this full range of, like, I would say, non toxic relationships um, that are going to have, you know, as Leah said, like bad days, but also maybe even toxic moments that um, that come and go. And I think, I, I mean, Leah and Kaysen were both, um, you know, I, I, I agree with both of y'all, but um, yeah, I think um, so much of it is about kind of unpacking those moments as they happen. I don't think, um, you know, having, um, you know, a relationship that has those bumps and like those, those conflicts um, is a bad thing. Like that doesn't mean it's a bad relationship. And I don't think that being, um, you know, a person who struggles like in a relationship or, you know, whether it's anxiety driven or, or whatever it is, like, I don't think that makes you um, unworthy of being in a relationship. Um, so I just think, um yeah you know i i like i definitely think about the relationship dynamics as i'm writing and i think about my audience as as i'm writing them but um you know i um i would never want to like overly sanitize that if, if it makes sense yeah i i think everyone just said it so well um the only thing i would i guess kind of add is i feel sometimes an extra responsibility, extra burden. I'm sure all of you can relate to this because when you're coming from a marginalized community and so some of that representation of potentially like a toxic relationship may be somebody from a marginalized community, maybe one that you're from. <laughs> and so there's that extra burden, I feel like, of to take care because you want to tell the truth about this particular story, but you're also aware that someone might read this and generalize all about people who look like you. And so... Um, there is that extra um, burden that I feel when I'm when I'm when I'm writing characters and I'm writing characters that have flaws and maybe bad characters. And that was a big issue in my my debut written in the stars about a girl who's forced into a marriage because there's a lot of bad people. There's a lot of good people, but it just takes a lot of extra. I, I felt a lot of pressure and I'm sure I'm sure all of you can relate to that, like that extra pressure when um, when you're afraid that someone might just stereotype. <laughs> <laughs> based on what they just read in your book. So it takes a lot of care and nuance, I think. This is like not even romance specific. I just wanted to tack on something to that. Like that is spot on, like so perfect, um, like encapsulate so much of what it means to be a marginalized writer. I think even with like my main character, this isn't even about the love story, but people are harsher on characters who have certain identities. And so I know that like the criticisms of my characters are gonna be very different than they are for cis straight white characters, right? And so like when I wrote Liz, Liz on paper is the perfect kid. She's the top of her class. She works really hard to take care of her family. She's first chair in her you know section in the band. And like, she's on top of it. She is without flaw because I know how hard it is for people to identify with black girls, but specifically queer black girls, unless they are completely unfallible, right? And so like in my second novel, both the girls are real messy because I think that there, we also have to be able to give each other permission to like make mistakes and have love that is a little, little chaos, but also still very much is like rooted and grounded and like being our best selves for not just ourselves, but for one another. Um, and so I just really, I thought that was a fantastic answer. I just, oh, you really <laughs> hit me where it hurts. <laughs> um, Leah, actually, my next question is just for you, because uh, I was going to ask you about, um, it, in, in You Should See Me in a Crown, one of the most pivotal relationships is Liz's relationship with her brother, because um, he's somebody who means so much to her and, and has so much to do with her motivations and her goals. And I wanted to ask you about um, 
the choice that went into writing a really strong sibling bond and um, you know what, what that meant to you, why it was valuable to the story. Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, one of my favorite things to talk about is um, love that is not romantic. So this is like a romance panel, but I do want to say like, I think that showing platonic intimacy or familial intimacy are just as important to a love story as the actual romance. Because the things that taught me how to love a partner, I learned from the people around me who cannot offer me those things, right? It's like, I learned how to be a better communicator from the people who I'm in group chats with. I learned how to show up for my friends that I have on Twitter. Like there, those relationships are what taught me how to be a better member of a romantic relationship. And so I try always to lean really firmly into those lines of desire as well. And, um, I just thought it was super important to show the way that family so often can drive the person you not only become, but the things that you value the most in your life. And I have a really strong relationship with my younger sister. We're the same age apart as Liz and Robbie. And so I didn't want a relationship where siblings were like catty with each other. Cause I had seen that a lot of that growing up. And that is very true. How many times have I fought with my sister? A lot. She's in the other room right now. I locked her in there cause I'm tired of looking at her. I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey Allie, I love you. Um, but you know, I just thought that it was really crucial to illustrate um, a familial bond that was affirming and um, constantly validating you in all these ways um, because that's what I have. And so, once again, I wanted people, young people especially, to know, like, this is possible. And even if it's not your blood family, like, you will find your family out there and these things will happen for you. I love that. Um, and Kason, actually, I was, this, this one is for you, because um, I was going to ask, uh, I, I think last year you and I talked about the pressure sometimes that queer authors feel to write very idealized and optimistic worlds and relationships. But in Felix, you wrote very realistic and complicated relationships between Felix and his parents. Um, and I wanted to ask about that and what it is that you hope young readers will take away from, from reading the way that Felix, um, both the support and lack thereof and how he handles it and what it, what it means to him personally, how it affects his development, what you want young readers to take away from, from that depiction. With his father. Um... It's a very good question. I think that for me, I wanted to write about Felix's father as a character that I haven't really seen as much in queer narratives. I feel like it's either the extreme of we are going to kick you out, we do not accept you in any way, or the extreme of, um, and not, I don't say extreme as in that's unrealistic, I mean just like on terms of like the spectrum, um, the other side of that spectrum being like, I will love you wholeheartedly and I accept you wholeheartedly. I feel like there is like a middle ground that I haven't seen as much of and I have experienced and I wanted to create that um, for people to be able to see reflected was just this kind of like middle ground of I love you. I'm going to try to understand, but I'm still going to make a lot of mistakes doing that. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I don't know if I was saying anything in, like specifically to teenagers as in like, I want you to take this away, like a lesson away from this, but I did write that kind of in mind with the hope that, you know, it's every person's specific um, decision on how they want to react to that. For me, it was important to have patience for the people in my life that, for example, were not getting my pronouns right after like the first week of coming out because they've known me for like 30 years as somewhat as something else. And now these are my new pronouns. So just kind of like suggest like offering that as another example of a way a relationship can be where you can have patience for people who um, make mistakes but are trying. So that doesn't have to be everyone's decision. Thank you. <laughs> I like that. Um, and Becky and Aisha, I, my question for you, uh, your yes, no, maybe so is extremely um, timely and topical uh, as we find ourselves <laughs> So, well, I mean, yes, okay, this election cycle has been endless and has lasted something <laughs> like 60 years by now. Um, but, you know, I, I wanted to ask you specifically how you approached writing teenagers who are very invested in their community, who clearly love much about where they live, but who encounter prejudice um, and have to sort of reconcile that with, you know, that this is a community that they're fighting for, but they are not, they're, they're not always feeling welcomed by it. How did you approach that and what, what, what message are you hoping that your readers will take away? 
I mean, this the story is set in Atlanta. Um, Becky and I both live here. Um, we even, if you read the book and you're from Atlanta, you're instantly going to recognize like most of it. <laughs> um, you know, um, and and that is my experience here. I, I think it's, and I think it's your experience too, Becky. Not to speak for you, but I think we love Atlanta, and uh, but sometimes I don't feel very welcome here. Um, there are times, um, and definitely I've had. Islamophobic issues happen. There's been anti-Semitic um, graffiti sometimes painted that's made the news. Like there's stuff that happens here. We I remember we went to the the temple uh, for our research, and there were so many like officers there and guards um, because they get so many threats. And so it is. It's something you have to reconcile. I think that you know, but but that's also why we're fighting for it because we do love this community and we do know there's so many good people out there and. Um, and that's why we went canvassing, which inspired this story. And that's why we're doing what we're doing, because it is worth it. Um, and, and I hope that that's what teens take away as they read it, is that, yes, there can be things that are really hard, but it's still worth it to fight for what we want. What do you think, Becky? I completely agree. And I, yeah, I mean, I, it's it's hard to know how, you know, it's hard to remember how intentional some of these choices were as we were writing, because Mm -hmm. In a lot of ways, it's like, well, we said it in our hometown, so we were like, don't mess up, you know, just basic things about the city. Like, we know, <laughs> we know Atlanta well done, it's not <laughs> ridiculous, but um, yeah, I, you know, and I think um, the kind of as you were speaking about this, Aisha, like one of the things that, um, you know, I keep coming back to is that like every time Georgia or another, you know, one of the our neighboring states down here does something ridiculous, which is like several times a day. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's really interesting kind of living here, um, but having kind of most of our, I would say most of our professional community, most of the people um, in our online network and orbit um, are not from the American South, you know, the deep South and, and everything. Um, and um, so, I mean, the, the most striking example for me was like after the um, 2017 special election that inspired Yes, So Maybe So, um, when we, when the Democrats like narrowly lost that election um, and it was an election that uh, absolutely made national news and everybody was following it. It was supposed to be kind of, you know, a referendum on Trump, one of the first ones. And, um, and like, the reaction was just very much like, you know, people throwing their hands up being like, what do you expect It's Georgia? Like, of course, like, you know, like y'all are idiots down there. You know, like, they probably didn't say y'all like, I, you know, like, <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, you know, and just, um, you know, just sort of writing off kind of entire, um, regions of the country and stuff when, you know, kind of when you live here, you know, the reality is, first of all, like, it, it is not that, um, you know, just demographically and just like in terms of kind of the voters and who, who's living here, like, um, we are not, a, you know, the kind of uh, white racist kind of state that people think of us. I mean, some parts are, you know, but um, no, we are a state that has a ton of voter suppression and like a lot mm -hmm. of structural things that are, that we are up against. And so, um, you know, I just, um, so I do, I do think like, I, I would love it if people reading us, so maybe so got that, um, you know, came away with the message that like, um, you know, some of these, um, some of these places that you may have um, kind of written off, you know, for, for these purposes, like, um, you know, there's like grassroots stuff happening there. And, um, you know, there are, you know, you will find um, like-minded people in every part of, of Georgia. And, um, you know, we in the South, and I'm, I'm guessing, um, this is also true of the Midwest and stuff. Um, we, and, you know, and like, we uh, like join with us and, and like send our candidates money, you know, <laughs> like, like, let's do this, so. 
Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I I have you know I've I've watched uh, the two of you um, you know talk about activism and on on social media and it's been really inspirational and I for one very much appreciate it. <laughs> um, Do you notice my um, subliminal message right there? Oh um, yeah, exactly. Just vote. coming up. <laughs> Please vote. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we've got about 15 minutes left. I am going to, I'm going to treat you all to a lightning round. Um, but when we are finished with that, that is, we will throw this over to audience questions. So those of you at home, if there is something that you want to know from this esteemed panel of, of authors, please think about those questions, articulate them and share them with us so that we have something to talk about when we're done. Um, but okay, so lightning round. I'm going to ask, I, Kason, you actually already talked about this, but you're going to talk about it again. Enemies to lovers or friends to lovers? I am going to opt out on actually answering that. It's a tie for me. <laughs> <laughs> I am always friends to lovers. That's just, I love it. <laughs> oh, I'm going enemies to lovers all the way. <laughs> I love chaos. <laughs> <laughs> Um, both. It depends on the like particular couple. Um, Caleb, I want to know your answer. My answer? <laughs> I, you know what? You know what? I think I prefer writing friends to lovers. Um, but I actually also, I kind of get a kick out of friends to enemies. That's, that is sort of a, <laughs> a that's an arc that I actually, <laughs> that's an arc that I particularly enjoy because I think it, I, it explores some, some other feelings that we don't see quite as much of in YA, but I think that are very common. So that's, that's my answer. It's a twist. Um, <laughs> so, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So team, team Gail or team PETA? This isn't even a question. Okay, so let's let's look at it two different ways, right? So either your team PETA or your team Katniss is ace and didn't want to be with anybody. That, <laughs> that feels like to me the only rational reading of the text. <laughs> and then somebody else is like, I'm actually team Gail. And I'm like, oh yeah, it's, it's totally valid. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm not. I'm not going to tell you guys what the right answer is, but that's the right answer. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a mic drop there, Leah. I was like, I'm <laughs> sorry. This is like, I didn't realize like I was into fandom until Hunger Games came along, and then I became like some fanatical like <laughs> Queen Suzanne Collins person, and so like this is the only conversation I had on the internet for like a half a decade. <laughs> Yeah, I have to. I have to admit, I was one of those people where I was like, I don't understand how there's an option. Like, I don't. I don't understand why they're trying to make this into a thing because there's clearly only one thing. Right. What? Where's the love triangle? It's barely a love anything, but you know, we love romance. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Peanut butter and jelly, or peanut butter and chocolate? Neither. <laughs> Sorry. Blasphemy. <laughs> I, mean, I, I will have turned out to have asked a panel of, of people who are allergic to peanuts. Right. Everybody <laughs> hates peanuts. I love peanuts. <laughs> you know what? I feel like I eat a peanut butter and jelly every day. Like, this is, that's at the core of who I am as a human being, probably. So, peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> I live for peanut butter. So, so I'm currently, I'm, I'm in Finland. I lived in Finland um, for a while and finding certain American foods was really challenging, but they have some great peanut butter here. Really <laughs> great peanut butter. It's like all natural. I love it. I'm, I will, I'm an evangelist for Finnish peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So does anybody else have thoughts on peanuts? No. Okay, well then, oh. <laughs> I want you all to tell me what you're reading right now. I I just started, um, I'm really, it's not out yet, I'm so sorry, but um, I just started Charming as a Verb by Ben Philippe. It is freaking adorable. I loved his debut, Field Guide of the North American. That one is out, so go by Field Guide. But um, yeah, I, um, yeah, it's exactly what I need right now. 
My books that I'm reading right now are sitting right here. So I'll just show you them. Um, I'm rereading Love from A to Z by S.K. Ellie. It's a lovely romance. I love it. And I am currently working on a middle grade. So I'm also reading More to the Story by Hina Khan. So those are two really good books that I'm currently deep diving. Um, I am late to this, but I'm reading uh, Piecing Me Together by Renee Watson for the first time. Oh, such so, a good one. <laughs> so beautiful. Um, let's see. I'm reading quickly, quickly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I released my sister from the other room so she could bring me this book. I'm reading <laughs> Happily Ever After <laughs> by Elise Barnett. Yeah, I already oh! like, <laughs> yes, it's so, it's so cute. Wow, this is wow. like, I can't wait to take my book mail picture for the week because I was so stoked to get this um, a few days ago. But anyway, I love it. I think it's going to be one of the best rom-coms of the year. Thank you. Uh, um, so I'd love to get some questions from viewers and I'm, I'm wondering how we're going to do that. Cause I don't, they're not coming up in the chat, in the chat window. Uh, so I'm going to wait for, uh, for questions to start appearing. And in the meantime, I'm going to ask some more of my own. Um, I, cause I, one of the, one of my other questions for you guys, I was, have you ever, um, have you ever <laughs> had someone, you know, think that a relationship in your work was based on your relationship with them. Like someone coming and be like, why'd you put our drama in your book? And you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Or maybe you do, because maybe you did it on purpose. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I put my like life into my story. So relationships have come from my life into, um, into my books and I have some, had like at least two people call me out on it and I'm like yeah well sorry <laughs> I get I get people reading into things that weren't meant to be read into like in my debut like um written the stars there's a character named Seba who's bad and really mean and I um and so anyways, like I started writing the book like 10 years ago. And in the process I made a friend named Seba who's like one of my really good friends and um so when the book came out and she read it, she contacted me and she's like, so what did I do? Like, what made you want to name this character after me? Like, is there some stuff we need to talk about? And I was like, no, sorry, it didn't even occur to me. It was just, it was her name from 10 years ago before I knew you. And so, yeah, she took it as a, as a like <laughs> a dig. Like she's like, is it about, she still brings it up anytime she has a chance. And so now I take a lot of care when I'm naming my characters and just like, okay, who do I know with that name? Cause I don't want to offend anybody. So. <laughs> That wasn't a mistake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, well, I mean, and this is not a um, romantic relationship either, but um, in the upside of Unrequited, which is um, kind of focuses on two sisters, um, you know, my sister read it and she absolutely, I, and I would say, correctly felt that like it drew heavily from our relationship um but like as i was writing it like i deeply identify with molly who's the point of view character my sister read it and felt very strongly that she was molly and i was cassie who is molly's sister so she kind of <laughs> uh <laughs> so. okay well we have some questions in, in the chat, <laughs> we have a few, um, and I'm gonna start with, why do you think so many adults read YA? Because I think that's actually a really interesting question. I can tell you why I read YA. Um, I read young adult um, because I like that most of the time they tend to end on a note of hope. It may not be a happily ever after, um, I like those too, but there's always some kind of hope and I, and I love adult books too, but there's sometimes where I'm so invested, I'm 500 pages in and then at the end it's just, she looked out the window and a bird flew by and that's the end. And I'm like, wait, but what, what happened? You know, and I understand there's a place for those books and I think that's great. And there's probably YA like that, but the way that I've read, I like that they, they just end on a note of hope. And right now in 2020, I can use all the hope I can get, so. 
Um, I kind of, yeah, I kind of, I wonder if it also has a lot to do with, um, you know, like for me anyway, I think that a lot of my kind of like old wounds happened from a younger age, from like middle grade, from YA. So reading YA helps me continue to heal. And I feel like that must be the case for a lot of people just kind of like navigating what it is that they went through at that age also. Yeah, I think, I think there's, oh, oh no. Do you want to hop in and take it? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Um, I think there's nothing like the just impossible bigness of first experiences. And there's something really cathartic, like Kaysen said, to be able to return to those moments as an adult and like have hindsight, but also like be able to have this sort of healing in a lot of ways, like for plenty of us, especially now that there's like this incredible, like robust, like queer YA that's coming out, um, you know, I didn't have these experiences when I was a teenager. And there's something really soothing about being able to reach back to 15, 16 year old me and like be able to give her these experiences now in my adulthood. I actually, and, and on that note, um, something that I tell when people ask me, you know, why do you write young adult? And I say, because the stories that I want to tell, I can't tell for adults. They, the, the, there is not the same support. There is not the same audience. There is not the same interest. If you try to tell queer stories for adults, they get pigeonholed um, very quickly. And I feel like you, there's so much more flexibility within YA, personally, my experience. Um, what are your thoughts on writing parent-child relationships? So um, I am really interested in exploring uh, familial structures that don't have the traditional like two parent household. And so like, whether that's I'm being raised by my grandparents or my mom's a single mom or, um, you know, my aunt is the one who takes care of me even though my parents are around or whatever the case may be. Um, I think writing adults into YA is so challenging because adults bring with them a certain set of uh, conflicts. It's like, okay, well, if there's parents around then you know, kids can't do certain things, whatever, whatever. Um, but I also just, I'm really interested in offering like different perspectives into families that don't look like the cookie cutter families that we're taught on TV are like what we should have. Um, and so my parents are everybody. My parents are the person who like walks you to school in the morning. My parents are the person at daycare who is the person who gives you your juice at night. You know, like the parents in my books are, the people who love you and take care of you, not necessarily the people who like brought you into this world. I do have a hard time writing about parents. Um, and I think it's because like plot wise, usually it's like the character is trying to learn something and grow from something. And sometimes the parent is like, doesn't really tie into what it is that they're trying to learn um, in the way that I would want them to. So I kind of like have to sit down and think like, well, what is it, how is this parent going to like fit into this character's specific story beyond um, showing like love on the page, which is always very nice to see, but I kind of just get sidetracked by, okay, so this is a beautiful scene. I love that there, there's love, but how is it like, how is their relationship like tying into moving the story forward? But maybe that's also just me being like, you know, way too much of a Virgo and too like analytical about things. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's it's so funny hearing your answer to this, Casey, because I um, I also kind of like go into it kind of not really excited about writing the parent stuff, um, but in my case, I think it's just because like I am. Um, most like immature little like love fiend in the world and I just feel like the parents keep getting in the way of all the like <laughs> pining and the making out <laughs> that I um really you know those are the things that um I'm most excited about every time when I go into writing a story um but you know there's um there's not a way to um to not include some kind of th that relationship in some way, because if it's not there, then uh, the absence is a thing. If that role is filled by somebody else, like that is significant too. Um, oh my gosh, at least I know how to fix it this time. Um, so I get a lot of, yeah, spam. I'm sorry. I don't know. <laughs> um, 
just, you know, we are almost out of time. Okay. Um, so I, I, hate, I don't want to cut any, I don't want to cut anybody off, but I have to cut you off. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, but thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you to everybody who has joined us from the comfort of your own homes. I want to urge you all to wash your hands and wear your masks, stay home when you can, socially distance when you can't. If you are 18 years of age or older, please register to vote at vote.org. Uh, or uh, if you have registered, please check your registration and confirm at vote.org because voter rolls can and have been purged without notice and you do not want to get caught unawares. Not every jurisdiction allows same day registration Registration, so you don't want to show up and be told your name is not on the roll and you cannot participate in democracy. So please, everybody, do your part. And thank you guys again for being here. Thank you. That's like, that's like.